All right, good to see you here this evening. Take a songbook. Let's start by singing together. Turn over, if you will, 195, down at the cross where my Savior died. Glory to his name. 195, once you have it, let's stand together to sing. 195, Brother Bob will lead us. Take your Bible this evening, if you would. Go to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, please. Continuing our study of the disciples of Jesus, and we're talking tonight about James, the son of of Zebedee and in John or Mark chapter 1 verse number 16 now as he walked by the sea of Galilee that's Jesus he saw Simon and Andrew his brother casting a net into the sea for they were fishers and Jesus said unto them come ye after me and I will make you to become fishers of men and straightway they forsook their nets and followed him and when he had gone a little further thence he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the ship, mending their nets. And straightway he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants and went after him. Now, Father, we ask you to give us your help as we open up your word and study it together this evening. We want to thank you, Lord, for the Bible. I'm thankful, God, that we can bring copies of it in our hand tonight. So many people in this world, they couldn't bring a copy of the Bible with them. They don't have one. We're so blessed to have your word. And I pray that we would be careful to uh, give your word the, the respect and the attention and the authority it deserves in our life. And Lord, tonight as we look at the life of James, the son of Zebedee, You'll help us to glean some things from his life and this devoted follower of Jesus Christ that will help us to be better followers of Jesus Christ. And it's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. James is one of three James you'll read about in the New Testament. We have James, the son of Alphaeus, he was also known as James the Less, or in some cases, James the Little. Maybe he was smaller of stature, I don't know for sure. But James the son of Alphaeus, his mother's name was Mary. Then you have James, another James you read about in the New Testament, is the half-brother of Jesus. Now the Roman Catholics like to teach that Mary didn't have any children but Jesus. But the only problem with that is that's not what the Bible teaches. So there were other children that she had. So he had a half-brother. In other words, they both had Mary as their mother, but Joseph would have been James' father. Joseph was not Jesus' father. He would be his stepfather, I guess, if you will. Uh, and James, the brother of the Lord, was not one of the original disciples. In fact, he was not a believer. The Bible says that he didn't really believe until the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So he was very late coming to the party, so to speak, uh, and being a believer in Jesus Christ and eventually became a very strong in the early church and a great leader in the church at Jerusalem. Uh, he's referred to as James the Great as opposed to James the Last. That's how they distinguished between the James. Okay? Then there's James, the son of Zebedee, that we're going to talk about. His mother was Salome, or Salome, not Salami, all right? Uh, Salome, or Salome. And, of course, we know his brother was John, James and John, usually mentioned together, okay? Now, number one, I want you to notice his pedigree. He was the oldest son of Zebedee. Zebedee was a wealthy and influential man. If you remember when uh, Jesus was betrayed and they took him away for trial, they, Peter followed afar off. There was another disciple, if you read about it in the Gospel of John, who uh, went up to the palace. And the, the Bible says when it was known that John was outside, it was known to the high priest, he commanded they let him in. And so John got into the inner court where he could see and hear the trial of Jesus Christ. 
The reason he got in probably was because of Zebedee. He was an influential man, a wealthy man, and so the high priest knew of his family and knew of his connection, and so he allowed him to come in while Peter had to wait outside uh, and warm his hands at the fire, and we know how that went. But his father, Zebedee, had a very successful commercial fishing business of which James and his brother John were working. Do you notice when Jesus, did you catch when Jesus called them to follow him in verse 20? They left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants. So they had people working for him. A very successful business. And uh, they walked away from that. We'll say more about that in just a minute. So that was his pedigree. But I want you to notice, secondly, James's privileges. James had some great privileges. First, they were called, he was called to follow Jesus Christ. We read about that in Mark chapter 1. They were simply in the ship preparing their nets, mending the nets, as it were, after having fished probably all night. And, you know, it's interesting, Jesus didn't call his disciples from the elite of society. He, he didn't go to the palaces, he didn't go to the wealthy people, just simply ordinary men. Aren't you glad God uses ordinary people? Uh, just ordinary folks like you and me. Uh, Moses was keeping sheep for his father-in-law on the backside of the desert when the burning bush came. And God told him what he wanted him to do. Gideon was threshing wheat, fearful of the Midianites. And, and uh, David was just a shepherd boy, almost really overlooked when Samuel came to anoint one of the boys to be the next king. In fact, Samuel had to ask his dad, is this everybody? Is this, is this all your sons? Well, there's one more. But, you know, he's just out there with the sheep. What's, you, know, you want him? Yeah, bring him on. <laughs> and, uh, of course, he was the guy. Okay, so God just uses ordinary people. I'm thankful for that. And so they were, uh, these were just fishermen. Many of the first disciples were just ordinary men. Now listen, they didn't just leave a business to follow Jesus Christ. They left a thriving business. They left to understand James being the oldest, when Zebedee would pass, who does the business go to? It'd be his. He's set for life. He would be uh, uh, set up and, and, and have it made, so to speak. Okay? And, uh, and, and he leaves all that to follow Jesus Christ. He had a great privilege to be called by Jesus. He had a great privilege to be part of the inner circle of Jesus Christ. Remember, we talked about 12 disciples, three sets of four uh, that you could have. And, and always the first four was always Peter, James, and John and Andrew. Those four. Always the inner circle. And especially Peter, James, and John are mentioned. Uh, those three always being the inner circle of Jesus Christ. James is always mentioned there. What a privilege to be called to follow Jesus Christ. But secondly, I want you to see something else. Look at Luke chapter 8. Would you turn over there with me? He was present at a notable miracle that Jesus did. In Luke 8, Notice with me verse 41. Luke 8 and verse 41. And behold, there came a, a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house. For he had one only daughter, about twelve years of age, and she lay a-dying. But as he went, the people thronged him. And a woman having an issue of blood twelve years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood staunched. And, and Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude thronged thee and pressed thee, and sayest thou who touched me? And Jesus said, Somebody has touched me, for I perceive that virtue has gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. 
And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. All right, now look, at, look here. Here's Jairus. His one and only daughter is dying. And, and listen, his position is he's a ruler of the synagogue. He's, a, he's a, got a pretty good position, a high position as a Jewish man. But he understands, if I just go with my religion, my daughter's going to die. Jesus can help her. And so he's going to forfeit his position. When they find out, those who run the synagogue, the higher-ups from him, find out that he is going to find Jesus, he'll be fired from his position. But he wants to save his daughter. And so he goes to Jesus, and Jesus agrees to come. And while he's coming, there's such a crowd, a woman touches him, and Jesus stops. And, and he says, somebody touched me. And Peter said, Lord, there's a crowd of people here. Everybody's pressing and you know hitting each other like when you're coming out from a ball game. You think somebody touched me? Or you, you, come on, Lord. And, and I'm sure Jairus was right there saying, yeah, let's go, let's keep walking. My daughter, remember? But Jesus stops and says, no, wait. Somebody touched me and he makes, he waits until this woman, he makes her make it public. There's another story in that, by the way. When you've been touched by Jesus Christ, you ought not to be ashamed of it. And Jesus always wants you to be, make, be public about that. Whosoever believeth in him should not be ashamed. And so he makes her make a public profession of faith, but I'm sure Jairus this time is saying, Precious time is wasted. Time is going by. Well, it gets worse. Look what happened. Verse 49. While he yet spake, while Jesus is still talking to the woman, there cometh one from the rule of the synagogue's house saying to him, Thy daughter is what? Dead. Trouble not the master. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him saying, Fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. When he came into the house, he suffered no man to go in save Peter and who? James and John and the father and mother of the maiden. Five people are going to see this miracle. Peter, James, John, mom and dad. That's it. Well, I guess the maiden will see it. <laughs> Six. And all wept and bewailed her. But he said, weep not, she's not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn knowing that she was dead. Well, if they're going to laugh at him, you know what Jesus did? He put them all out and took her by the hand and called, saying, Maid, arise. And her spirit came again. And she arose straightway, and he commanded to give her Oreo cookies. No, he commanded to give her some meat. And her parents were astonished. And he charged them that they should tell no man what was done. You, uh, now, this is amazing enough. To me, it would be amazing enough to have him heal this woman who had an issue of blood for all these years and had spent all her money on the physicians and wasn't any better, only got worse. Good to know doctors haven't improved much from those days, hasn't it? And, uh, and, and, and finally, she just touched Jesus and she's made whole. That had been wonderful enough. But now they get to Jairus' place and they, they wonder, well, are we going to see America? Well, she's dead. They've already begun wailing and weeping, which is what the Jews do when there's a death. And so Jesus puts them out and he takes the mother and the father and Peter, James, and John. And he just goes in, just them, the private party. She speaks, he speaks to this little girl, 12 years old, and just tells her, Maid, arise. And guess what? She gets up. She gets up. Jarvis was talking to me about someone who, they really, a family that just wanted God to bring their mother back. And I think he was relating to me today, if I remember right, even at the funeral home. They're at the coffin and begging God to, and she's going to sit up. Well, it didn't happen. But it did this day. And she sat up and said, give her something to eat. So they gave her something to eat, and they, they were, notice, they were astonished, verse 56. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you be amazed? 
uh, it'd be it just is incredible thing. So he, what a great privilege to have a front row seat to see a miracle like this. You ever, you, you understand? You, if if you weren't there, you'd never appreciate it. You ever been in a great service? I mean, where God just met with you and. And maybe folks were saved or great decisions were made for Christ or something amazing happened and you try to tell somebody what it was like and they just look at you like, oh, yeah, that's nice. And you're like, no, you don't get it. You, you don't understand. Because you, you, you can't, you, 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 don't, you don't get If you weren't there, you just weren't there. And I'm sure they tried to relay this to the other disciples, but it just didn't come through. What a privilege. James was to be part of this miracle. But he wasn't done. Go to the book of Matthew and look at Matthew 17. There's another privilege he had, not only to be called by Christ and to be a disciple, but to, rise, to be there at the raising of Jairus' daughter. But he got something else here in Matthew 17. Jesus, it says in verse 1 of Matthew 17, after six days, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Understatement of the year. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. Elias is Elijah. And while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. And they came down from the mountain. Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. So now he's also privileged because he's one of the three that got to see the revelation of Jesus Christ. He got to see Jesus Christ in a glorified form. Jesus was transfigured right before his eyes. They got to see Christ in his glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. They saw firsthand that Jesus Christ is indeed the Son of God. I saw that with my own eyes. Peter talks about it later when he wrote the book of, of 1 Peter. Not only that, they heard the voice of God. And they were afraid because they, they probably figured if I hear the voice of God, I'm dead. <laughs> God's going to kill me now. And Jesus had to say, don't be afraid. It's going to be all right. But they heard God saying, this is my beloved Son. Hear Him. And, and, I mean, they, got to see, they even got to see Moses and Elijah. Think about that. Now, the, the, a great privilege, and yet, think about this. Jesus said, now you can't tell anybody. How hard would that be? You just saw this, this Christ glowing and glorified and bright as the sun, and then Moses and Elijah and the voice of God, and then he says, now, how great as that was, Keep your mouth shut. How different that is from today, huh? They'd been on all the talk shows and wrote a book and had a movie and everything else about it. You said, no, you just be quiet until after I'm risen from the dead. It's amazing. What a privilege. So I think he was privileged at the rising of Jairus' daughter, at the revelation of Christ on the mountain. Then in Matthew 26... Look over to that passage, if you would, please. I think he was privileged to, at the request of Jesus Christ in the garden, the request of Jesus Christ in the garden of Gethsemane. In Matthew 26, Jesus is coming to the place. Verse 36, Matthew 26, verse 36. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. Well, who is that? James and John. And began to be sorrowful and very heavy. And he saith unto them, My soul 
is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto his disciples and findeth them, what? Asleep. And saith unto Peter, what? Could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went again and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now, take your rest. But the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. And then, of course, Judas showed up in the next verse. So he tells the first group of disciples, as he goes to the garden, he tells the first group to wait here. And he's going a little further to pray. And he takes three more with him. Peter, James, and John. And he goes a little further. And then he stops and tells them to wait there and to pray. And he's going a little bit further. I don't think he necessarily was out of earshot to them. I think they could have heard him pray. I think these were the closest earthly friends Jesus had. These three men right here. No doubt they heard him pray, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Luke says angels came and answered that prayer and strengthened Jesus that night. We know that he, he sweat as it were great drops of blood being in such agony that night. And the angel came to strengthen him. I think it's another lesson, but I think Satan was trying to kill Jesus Christ that night in the garden. When you're sweating blood, you're in, you're in trouble. And, and I think God strengthened him that night. And, and we know from Hebrews, his prayer was heard that evening. He said it was, he offered prayer with great crying and tears and was heard and that he feared. So I know God heard his prayer this night. An angel strengthened him. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure these three, listen now, I'm sure on that mount of transfiguration, when Jesus begins to get bright and, and as bright as the sun, and then Moses and Elijah show up, and then a cloud overshadows the voice of God. I don't think any of them were having trouble keeping their eyes open. I think they were pretty wired, don't you? But now when it's time to pray, they're heavy-eyed and they're falling asleep. Jesus is praying. He's emotionally exhausted. He, he turns to these three guys, and really all of them, who said, we'll be with you. Jesus had said, you're all going to forsake me and run away. Peter was the one who said, oh, they all may do it, but I'm not going to do it. But likewise said they all. They all said, we're with you in this, God. We're with you all the way, Jesus. And as he's in agony and it's come down to the time of his betrayal and he's praying, he comes to these men who adamantly said, we're with you all the way. And they're sleeping. And the first time, he said, couldn't you watch with me one hour? Now, don't get too hard on the disciples. I won't, I won't take a poll but there's probably very few people in this room that have ever prayed for one hour. We sing, sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, but most Christians have never experienced one. Don't get too hard on them. But if anybody should have been watching and praying, it should have been them. And especially after the first time, you think the next time you'd have stayed with it, don't you think? But they didn't. 
so often when we think we're strong, we're weak. The time you think you've got it, the time you think, oh, I got this, oh, I, I'm, I'm good, that's when you're going to find out how weak you are. Don't you think that way? I pray we'd learn that the Spirit indeed is willing, but our flesh is weak. And so we watch and pray that we enter not into temptation. What an what a honor to be requested by Jesus Christ to pray with Him. But have not we been given that same honor? And how many of us neglect to do that? Haven't we been invited to come boldly to the throne of grace? And how many of us take advantage of that? How many of us, when it's time to get up in the morning and spend time with God, hit the snooze and go to sleep? Instead of get up and spend time with God. What a, what a privilege he had to be called to follow Jesus to the rising of Jairus' daughter, to the revelation of Christ on the mountain, to the request of Christ in the garden. But I want you to notice number three, his reprimand. Go to Luke chapter 9, and we see that James and John get a reprimand. This is in Luke chapter 9. Are you okay? You doing all right? Luke chapter 9. Let's start with verse number 49. Notice the Bible says, And John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him because he followeth not with us. And Jesus said unto him, Forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. And it came to pass, when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. He sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they, the people of Samaria, in that village, did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, who? James and John saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? But he turned, and here's their reprimand. He rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. So they get rebuked. Jesus is going to go to Jerusalem. And I know that's where He's going to be betrayed. That's where He's going to be crucified. And he'll have to, He's going to go through Samaria. We'll talk about that Sunday in our Sunday school lesson when He goes through Samaria and witnesses to the woman at the well. He sends messengers ahead of time to get a place to stay and they go to a village of the Samaritans and they won't receive Him. Now, and, and, and because He wants to go to Jerusalem, the Samaritans... There were two, you'll find out Sunday in our Sunday school lesson, there are two temples, one in Mount Gerizim and then one in Jerusalem, and they didn't want anything to do with Jerusalem. And so, if he's going there, we don't want anything to do with him going there. And so, uh, James and John say, okay, Lord, they, they don't want any part of you? How about we call down fire from heaven and make post toasties out of them right now? Let's just burn them up, God. Let's just fry them. That's in the original. It's going to take care of them. And, and by the way, they, if they knew any Old Testament stories, they knew the one about Elijah calling down fire from heaven. And, and it wasn't on Mount Carmel. It was when Ahab sent messengers out to get Elijah. Do you remember? He sent a company of 50. And, and Elijah said, let fire come down and fire come down and burn them all up. He sent a second 50. Fire came down and burnt them up. Now, now, I don't know about you, when the king came to me and said, I want you to lead the next 50, I'd say, no thanks, I don't think I want that job. I, I, I don't think I want to go out there. 
And, and the guy went out begging for his life. Really, he did. And, uh, and I understand that. But they knew that story. They knew what Elijah had done. And so they want to do that. But Jesus, of course, rebukes them for their attitude. Now, let me tell you a couple things I like about James and John here. I like the fact they had faith that they could call down fire from heaven. Now, could they have done it? I don't know, but they believed they could. They had been with Jesus. They'd seen Him do miracles. They'd seen, and they believed that if they call down, if they asked God to do that, God would do that. That's faith, brother. And so they had faith to believe that. I, I like that. I like the fact they were upset that someone was dishonoring Christ. You don't want to help Jesus? Well, <laughs> you're no friend of mine. And buddy, they're ready to take it in their own hands. And so I like the fact they're upset. They had, a, they had a zeal for righteousness. I like that. I like the fact, though, that they asked before they did something. Before they, before they called down fire, notice they, they, they said to Jesus in a verse number 54, Wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven? They didn't act without the Lord's approval. You ever done that? Went ahead and did whatever you thought you should do and then said, God, bless this, would you? We take off and say, this is what I'm doing. And you say, wait a minute, God, you coming? We're supposed to get His approval first and then do what He says. Not go off on our own and say, oh yeah, I guess, I guess we should pray. Oh really? Have not we gone on and taken off and not gotten God's approval? And then ask Him to come along? We have to go to the Lord first and let Him tell us how to act and to react to situations. Jesus says, I didn't come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. I begin to understand why Jesus called these two the sons of thunder. <laughs> You're getting to get a little glimpse about how they were. And, and the solution is really simple. Did you see it in verse number uh, 56? The Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. In the last sentence, they went to another village. All right, you don't want to stay here? That's fine. We'll go down the road. There's another village. Somebody doesn't want to listen to you when you knock on their door and try and give them the gospel? Fine, go to the next house. Go to the next house. Go to the next person. Don't call down fire on them. Just, just go to the next person. Go to the next village. Pretty simple, huh? You know, because he did that, Jesus didn't, didn't say call down fire and burn them up. When, he, when the disciples gathered in that upper room and He gave them for the last time the Great Commission, in Acts 1.8, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost come upon you and you'll be witnesses unto Me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and in the uttermost parts of the earth. Philip in Acts 8 goes to Samaria and a great number of people believed. You think they'd have believed if in their history the disciples had called down fire from heaven and burn a bunch of them up? Never. But because Jesus just said, let's just go to another village. Now a great number believe. See, always leave that door open for somebody coming after you. Don't burn the bridge that they'll never want to listen to anybody else. So important. So that was one reprimand. The other reprimand came in Matthew chapter 20. Would you go back to the book of Matthew? Matthew 20. This is the second reprimand that they received from the Lord. And again, they were kind of together in this one as well. In Matthew 20, and verse number 20, Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children, with her sons. Well, who are the sons of Zebedee? James and John. By the way, their mom, Salome, or Salome, was 
history believes that she was Mary's sister. So it would be Jesus' aunt. So they're, they're appealing to aunt power here to try to get what they want. And here's what she does. She comes worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on thy left, in thy kingdom. And Jesus answered and said, You know not what you ask. Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they say unto him, We are able. And he said unto them, You shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give. But it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. Now, they, they, they got this. If you look back in Matthew chapter... 19 and verse number 28 Jesus said unto them in Matthew 19 28 verily I say unto you that ye which have followed me in the regeneration when the son of man shall sit in the throne of his glory ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel so they remember this twelve thrones all we want is we want to sit on the throne on your right side and on your left side. That's all we're asking. Just the, just the two positions of power and authority. at your right hand and your left hand. Now, how do you think... By the way, that didn't settle too well with the other ten. You can, you can understand. Why? Because they wanted those seats. That's why they were upset. They were not upset so much that they asked. They were upset they asked before they could ask. Because they all wanted to have the preeminence. They all wanted to be numero uno. Comprende? Huh? Little, do a little Spanish in there for you. All right? By the way, while I'm thinking about it, we are, I, I'm, we're going to get Saturday, we're going to have our flyers, we're going to have some Spanish flyers for you to pass out in the, a lot of the, the uh, trailer park there off Sullivan. Isn't that a lot of Spanish families in there? Next year? We want them in Spanish so you can go in there and invite them to come. Okay? Make that happen. Amen? Good. Bueno. Bueno. All right. So they enlist their mother, the aunt of Jesus, to ask Jesus this question. And by the way, when he says the cup, he's talking about his suffering. The baptism is death that he's going to have and the, the death he's going to experience. He says, are you, are you prepared to suffer and die like I'm going to suffer and die? And of course, they flippantly, I think, said, yeah. And Jesus said, okay. Yeah, you're going, it's going to happen to you. James didn't know it's just going to be a few years from now. He's going to be the first one that he will suffer that. James, see, James wanted a crown of glory. Jesus gave him a cup of suffering. James wanted power, but Jesus gave him servanthood. James wanted prominence, but Jesus gave him a martyr's grave. So Jesus calls His disciples together. Notice again in Matthew 20. Verse 24, when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. But Jesus called them unto Him and said, He's going to take this opportunity now to teach them all something. Okay, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus says, I, I want to teach you a truth, fellas. You're not here to be served. You're here to serve. You're here to be a servant. 
A servant means this. One who's devoted to another to the disregard of his own interests and his own will. Any disregard of my own interests, disregard of my own will, I'm completely devoted to who I'm going to serve. Are you a servant of Jesus Christ? Do you set aside your will? Do you set aside your interests and seek to live for Jesus Christ alone? Be careful. Don't answer too quickly. (laughs) Do I seek to be served or to serve? Do I, do I, am I consumed with what I am doing for Jesus Christ or am I concerned about what Jesus Christ is doing for me? What consumes my mind, is it all about what God is doing for me or not doing for me or is it what I am doing for Him? Well, number four is his, James's persecution and his death. That comes in Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12, and we'll wrap it up. Acts chapter 12. This is interesting. Hopefully, some of the other stuff was too, but this is good too. Acts 12. Now about that time, verse 1, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed... James, the brother of John, with the sword. That's it. It's about A.D. 42. It's the reign of Herod Agrippa. Herod launches a new campaign against the church, against believers. And one of the first ones, if not the first one to be arrested, is James. And he has him beheaded. a notable historian of the day named Clement gives an account and he said there was a man named Josias, J-O-S-I-A-S, that brought false accusations against James that caused him to be condemned. But as he writes in the history that he recorded of this time, He writes, as the trial was conducted, Josiah saw the character and faith of James and was moved to declare himself a Christian. As a result, both James and Josiah were taken away and beheaded. On the way to the executioner, Josiah begged James to forgive him. And James simply paused and said, Peace be with you. And he gave him a kiss. Now it's interesting to note, did you notice that James is beheaded and Peter, he took Peter and he arrested Peter as well. But as you know, if you read the rest of Acts chapter 12, Peter doesn't die. There's a prayer meeting goes on. And an angel is dispatched and He gets Peter out of prison. That's when he knocks on the door, remember? And Rhoda comes and says, Hey, Peter's at the door. And they all say, Nah, it's his ghost. Boy, that's praying in faith believing, isn't it? Only one person believed it was really Peter, and that was probably Rhoda. Because she went and answered the door. Probably when she heard that knock, I bet you that little girl said, There's Peter. We prayed he'd get out. There he is. That's how children believe, amen? All the adults are saying, No, 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 no. But there he was. Let me ask you a question. How come he allowed James to get his head cut off and delivered Peter? That's that's up to God. That's all up to God. Why Why does one person get delivered from cancer and another person dies of cancer? We don't know. Somebody was... Who was talking to me? I know, a lot of people. 
uh, I can't remember who it was. They said they, they had somebody who they knew who had, I think it was Terry Lynn. I think, I think someone who they knew had survived Pearl Harbor. Survived the attack of Pearl Harbor, came back home, was in a bar, I think, and a fellow came up and shot him in the chest, killed him. How do you explain that? Only God knows. There, there are things we're not going to know. The secret things belong to God. I know this. When we get to heaven and we look at things from His perspective, we'll say, you do all things well. You do all things well. There's not one of us that are going to second guess God. It won't happen. We'll be ashamed that we ever second guessed him down here. James was changed. From a son of thunder to a man of peace and silence. James learned to bridle his tongue redirect his zeal, lose his selfish ambition, and was greatly used by God in the early church in Jerusalem. What a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. James, the son of Zebedee. Lord willing, next Wednesday night, we'll study his brother, John. James and John. He'll be our subject for next Wednesday night. All right, let's stand together and we'll have a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for the Apostle James. Thank you, Lord, for his life and for his testimony, the things that we've been reminded of this evening. Lord, all of us could understand that we've been called to be followers of Jesus Christ. We have had great privilege Blessed are the eyes that have seen the things that you've seen. The ears that have heard the things that we've heard. So we've had great privilege, God. We live in a blessed country of the United States of America. We have seen you do some miraculous things. Father, help us to maintain a right spirit. Don't let us be in the flesh. Don't let us think we're something. For without you, we can do nothing. So help us to learn what you taught your disciples. That as we see what you taught them and what they learned from you, may we learn it as well. And help us each to be faithful followers of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Dismiss us now with your care, Lord. Keep us busy about your work. Help us to be truly servants of Jesus Christ. It's in your name we ask it. Amen.